Hey, it's Rick Kettner here. And in this episode, we're gonna go through three valuable insights from They Ask, You Answer by Marcus Sheridan. This book is all about how to use content marketing to grow your business, how to create the right content to attract more potential customers and to build trust and authority in your category. Now, there are a lot of great books out there on content marketing. A lot of them focus on the content creation process, how to build an audience, how to eventually turn that audience into a business. But when it comes to taking an established business where you already have products, you already have services, and you simply wanna add content marketing into the mix to grow that business, in my opinion, this is the very best book on that particular subject. So if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a marketer, if you're a salesperson, or really anybody else that wants to use content marketing to grow an established business, then I recommend that you consider picking up a copy of the book. With that in mind, let's dive into my three favorite insights, beginning with insight number one. Build trust by addressing customer questions. Expectations have changed a lot over the last 10 or 15 years, and today, customers wanna be able to do initial research to make sure that they're making a more informed decision. So it's not just about coming to your business and then hearing about your products and services. They wanna do their own research, and they wanna figure out what product or what service is right for them. And according to the book, approximately 70% of buying decisions today, whether it's B2B or B2C, these are made before talking with a specific company. So customers are doing their own research, they're largely coming to their own decision, and then they finally just call up the company and say, okay, we're ready, we know exactly what we want, here's what we want. And in some cases, they might be more informed than the person that they're talking with on the phone because they've looked at all the different alternatives out there on the marketplace and they've come to their own decision based on being objective about what is available out there in the marketplace and making their own comparisons. And yet with all of this reality that has happened over the last 10 to 15 years, many businesses are still trying to control the conversation. They're trying to manage the buying experience. They wanna manage when potential customers find out about certain information like pricing or alternatives or competitors out there. And so they're hesitant to do things like address pricing on their website, to address alternatives. In many cases, they just pretend the competition doesn't even exist. They wanna get you on the phone or they wanna to talk to you in person and unveil the information in the order that they feel is gonna give them the strongest upper hand in terms of trying to close the sale. But if we wanna better serve customers today with this new reality, it's really important, and this is one of the core messages of the book, that we don't try to control everything, that we provide potential customers with the information that they need to be able to do this research that is more and more important today so that they can come to their own conclusion. So more than anything, They Ask You Answer is a business philosophy around serving your customers better through content creation. And this can take the form of answering their questions, providing objective information, and actively educating them, not just about your products, but about the kinds of things that they need to think about in order to make a more informed decision. And of course, the end result here, as I hinted at earlier, is you can attract a much larger audience because you're providing helpful answers to common questions. You're gonna start showing up in search engines. People are more likely to share and recommend your content to other people, so you're attracting a much larger audience. And then number two, you're becoming a trusted authority because when people start consuming your content, number one, they have some gratitude and they're thankful that you are producing this content for you for them, but in addition to that, they're seeing you as an authority in the marketplace, as the business that is looking to serve customers, provide the helpful information. You're not trying to steer them in one direction or another. You're simply giving them the information that they need to come to their own conclusion so they can make a more informed purchasing decision. And it's not just about, like I said, closing sales. It's about establishing trust. It's about building a relationship. It's about being the brand in your category that is legitimately trying to help customers find the right product for them, even if 
In one particular case, it might not be what it is that you offer and you might end up directing them to a competitor because it's all about the long game of building trust and establishing a relationship and providing objective information. Now, when it comes to actually making this happen, because you might be sold on the idea, this might make perfect sense to you. As a customer of other businesses, you might realize, hey, this is exactly what I want from a business and this is the kind of business that I would trust as a customer. So if you're sold on this idea, let's move on to insight number two. Start with the five most important subjects. According to the book, there are five specific themes that you wanna focus on when it comes to the kind of content that you're gonna create. Number one, pricing and costs. Number two, problems. Number three, verses and comparisons. Number four, reviews. And number five, best in class. Now, I'm gonna focus on the first three the book obviously goes into a much more detail on all five of these, but I wanna give you a quick taste of the kinds of things that you wanna be thinking about. So number one is pricing and costs. And the main issue here is helping customers understand exactly how much your product costs, or in some cases when there's variable pricing or there's a lot more complexity going on, it's about how your pricing works. Now, the reason why some businesses are hesitant to put this information out there is that number one, your prices might vary, so it's very difficult to provide a simple number to customers. Number two, you might want to establish context. You might feel if you just put a number out there, they're not gonna have a sense of how that compares with another business and why your price might be higher or it might be lower. And finally, you might simply not wanna scare customers away because if you just give them the grand total up front for let's say a really complicated project, like as an example in the book, a pool installation, or maybe something like painting an interior of a house. Well, if you just give them the final figure, maybe that's gonna scare them away and they're never really gonna understand just how much value you're providing. But in all cases, regardless of what it is that you're doing, you have to put yourself in the shoes of your customer. What would you want as the customer? Well, you'd wanna understand how the pricing works. You might understand that there are a variety of factors that can drive the price up or down. You would wanna get a basic sense of what those factors are and what kinds of things that you need to be aware of when making a purchasing decision. You might understand that some products are gonna be more premium than others. You simply wanna understand, well, why is the price higher? You wanna have that explained to you in plain, objective, transparent language so you can simply understand, okay, this is why this one costs more. Here's some options that can drive the cost up or drive the cost down. You wanna be informed as a customer. So regardless of the objections, the whole idea here, a recurring theme in the book is that you wanna put yourself in the shoes of the customer. What would you wanna know even if there's no one final price or there's varied pricing or whatever the case might be, what would you want to know? And as a real genuine customer of a potential product, would you be scared off by the price? And another thing I would just mention here is depending on the format, like if you're using a video, for example, to explain your pricing, you can go through things and actually establish context. You don't have to jump right out with the price as the only thing on the page, you can, break things down. You can say, here's what's involved in, let's say, installing a pool. Here are the different steps, here are the different things that add to the price, and here's ultimately what the final cost might look like depending on the options that you select. So you can be very careful about how you deliver this information if you're concerned about scaring customers away, but at the end of the day, again, it comes back to what would you want as a customer? What's the information that you would feel you need in order to make a more informed buying decision? Let's move on to number two, problems. This is a big category because when people go to buy something, especially if it's an expensive purchase of some kind, their number one concern is what might go wrong. And all too often, there are all kinds of things that could go wrong, and this creates a scenario where, as described in the book, there might be a big elephant in the room. Somebody's coming to buy your product, and there's common issues that you know customers might hear about or they might discover when they're researching online, but you're hesitant to bring it up because you don't wanna introduce them to a potential problem, especially if you feel like it's not that big of a problem and you're very confident it's unlikely to happen for them or that there are easy ways to mitigate it. You know, why scare the customer? Why introduce the problem if they're not even aware of it? But as the book explains, and as you really wanna change your thinking on this, it's important to understand that customers today, if they're conducting in this research, they will find these issues. They will go to Google, they'll enter your product name and say problems or negative reviews, or they'll enter some search phrases to do as much research as they need in order to feel confident about the purchase, especially if it's relatively expensive. And 
you know, even for a smaller purchase, if it's an investment of significant time or energy in terms of when they get the product, they're still gonna be very careful. And so just assume that potential customers are gonna figure this out on their own. You might as well be the one to create content to explain potential concerns and why those concerns may not be as big of an issue. You don't wanna do this in a defensive tone, but you just wanna simply say, you know, here are common concerns that people have when it comes to this product. Here are the solutions, or here's more information in terms of why you may not need to be as concerned as you might initially believe. And so one example of a potential headline based on one that I saw in the book would be, here are the most common problems with blank and how to solve them. You know, a simple article about your product and the kinds of concerns that people might have or might discover when they start to research your product. Let's move on to number three, versus and comparisons. This is a big one because again, a lot of businesses like to pretend that there is no competition and they don't even wanna talk about alternatives and this is all under the assumption that maybe a customer is just gonna come to you and they're simply gonna be ready to buy without doing any additional research. As with the previous one, number two, you really wanna just assume people are aware of alternatives out there. They understand the different versions of the product that might exist, and you wanna be open and honest and transparent about the different options that exist, and you wanna to explain to them the information they need to make a decision. So I'll give you a perfect example of this. I co-founded a company called Drumio. We helped people learn how to play drums online. Well, the business still helps people learn how to play drums online. I'm no longer a associated with it. But with the business, we knew that a lot of people are comparing online video lessons to offline alternatives like private one-on-one -on -one lessons, or even things like Skype one-to-one -one lessons over the internet with a private instructor. This is a very common comparison that people are gonna make. Is it better to go to private one-on-one -on -one lessons, or is it better to use online video-based lessons that are either live or video on demand, something like a Netflix where there's a big library of lessons that cover the topics in greater detail with slow motion video and multi-angle video, but depending on the format, you may or may not have a quick answer to a question you might have unless there's a live component, which we eventually did add. But the point I'm trying to make here is this is a common question that people are just simply gonna have. Which one should they choose and why? And so instead of pretending like private instruction doesn't even exist, you wanna explain the pros and cons. And in this case, if you're a younger student, if you need mentorship, if you need guidance, if you need your practice to be managed, or anything like that, if you lack the self-motivation to achieve something, then we would strongly recommend, and we always did, go with private lessons. If you're a younger student, go with private lessons. It's a format that is much more geared towards younger students that need mentorship. But if you know exactly what you wanna learn, if you're motivated, if you wanna save money, well, private lessons are much more expensive, so if you go to online lessons, you can get a huge library of video lessons on all kinds of topics from a wide variety of experienced instructors, and it's less expensive because, of course, the internet allows you to scale this up. So instead of paying upwards of $120 a month for private lessons, you could get an all-access subscription for as little as $30. So this is an example of just simply providing them the information they need to make a purchase. They might decide private lessons are a better fit for them, and that's okay. You're not trying to win over everybody, you're trying to build trust. You're trying to provide the objective information that they need to ultimately make the right purchasing decision for them. And if you're playing the long game, over time, you're gonna attract the customers that are a right fit for your business, and you're gonna build trust even for those that move on and choose a different service, and they're more likely to recommend your business to a friend who might be a better fit for your business simply because you're being transparent and honest. So that's number three, versus and comparisons. Now, one other category I would add into the mix, and again, there is number four and number five covered in the book with more detail, but one that I would add into the mix is what I call how-to content. And the idea here is it's very valuable if you can create content that help people either use your product or service more effectively, or you simply educate them on how they could do it themselves. The classic do-it-yourself category, DIY. And the reason why you might wanna create this kind of content, even though it might seem like you're almost putting yourself out of, out of a job, I'll give you a quick example before I explain how this works or why you wanna do this. Let's say that you're an interior painter and you decide, hey, there's a lot of people out there using Google to figure out how to paint a room. They're interested in learning how to paint a room. Well, you're a professional painter. Do you really wanna teach someone how to paint a room? 
Well, yes, you do, because there are three different kinds of people that might look at a video like that. Number one, there's gonna be some chunk of people that are genuinely interested in learning how to do it themselves because they want to do it themselves. You might as well create the video. They're gonna find a video on the subject anyway. You might as well help them, serve them, build trust, expand your reach, and grow your audience. The second group are people that think they wanna do it themselves. So they look up a video, and they see how it's done, they see how to protect their furniture, they see you know, how to tape off windows and walls and stuff like that, how to choose the right paint, all the different videos you might create on the subject, and they decide, you know what? Interesting to learn how it's done, but I just want a professional. So I'm almost certainly, if that's me in that spot, I would likely choose the business that showed me how it's done, especially if they make it clear in their videos that this is something they offer professionally. I would likely choose them so long as they're local or available or something like that. Then there's a third group of people, and this is the group that they're under no illusions that they wanna do it themselves. They simply wanna see how it's done. They wanna understand what's involved in painting a room. What are the kinds of things you should think about in ter terms of paint selection or maybe doing some sort of a duo tone pattern? Maybe they simply wanna see different creative ways of painting a room so they get their own ideas for what they wanna bring to the table when they talk with a professional. So by creating content like this, that is how to or do it yourself, Again, you serve an audience that is gonna find this kind of content anyway, might as well be you, but you also serve these other two groups that are much more likely to engage with your business having learned about these insights from you. So that's just another category you might wanna add into the mix. And the book didn't mention that specifically, but it kind of falls under the category of you, they ask, you answer. So if the customer is asking this kind of information of anybody out there and it relates to your category, maybe they're going to Google, and asking how to paint a room, well, it's your role to try to answer those questions, to be helpful, to build a relationship, and ultimately to become a trusted authority in your category. Let's move on to insight number three, the impact on sales teams and culture. One of the great things about setting out to create great content is that it really forces your team, especially your sales team or anybody else that might be involved in helping to put together this content, it really forces you to think more clearly about how you can serve your audience. You need to understand their questions, their concerns, their fears, their objections. And of course, for anybody in sales, you're almost certainly aware of a lot of these things, but it really forces you to get organized and to get clear on this kind of thing because if you're gonna produce great content, you need to know these things. You need to know them inside and out. So even if you never create a single piece of content, simply taking this approach of brainstorming ideas, going through all the exercises of coming up with great content ideas, and really thinking more clearly about the questions, the concerns, the fears, the objections, that alone is sort of a team exercise is gonna take your organization to the next level. Now, of course, actually producing the content is where the whole strategy really takes shape, but simply going through this mental exercise of coming up with ideas and as an organization on an ongoing basis, being aware of questions that are coming in from customers, noting them, have we addressed that question? Have we not addressed that question? It really forces the organization to be much more mindful of the kinds of questions that are coming in and being aware. Is that something we've addressed on our website? Is it something we have not yet addressed on our website? Now, when you go to create this content, what's really amazing about this strategy, especially for your sales team, is that this content exists 24 seven. It's searchable on the internet, it's discoverable, it's shareable. And so in many cases, and this is something that I alluded to earlier, People are gonna come in contact with this content and they're gonna develop a relationship with your business even before their first human-to-human -human contact. They're gonna look at an article, maybe see the picture of the author. They might watch a video and see somebody from your business explaining something important. Whatever the case might be, they have this opportunity to recognize your brand as a trusted authority. And in some cases, again, depending on, a, on the format, they can start to build a relationship with individuals from your organization. And this is incredibly powerful because if you've ever followed, let's say an author or a podcast or anything like that, you recognize the power of this kind of a one-way relationship where you've never actually spoken to that author or you've never actually talked to that podcaster, but you've consumed enough of their content that you feel like you really know them. You have a sense for who they are. You can see they're trying to be helpful. You've seen enough of their content or read enough of their content 
that you have a sense of the kind of person they are and that their goal is to ultimately help you. And when this kind of relationship is established, that customer, when they have an opportunity to conduct business with you, it's a completely different mindset. They're coming to the table with established trust, and they're much more likely to kind of move the conversation forward because you don't have to worry about establishing these things after the first point of human-to-human -human contact. They already feel they know you, they can already see you're there to help, and you can simply move the conversation forward. Another really powerful thing with content marketing in general, is that if you're using a tool like HubSpot or Keep, formerly Infusionsoft, or anything like that, if a customer has the opportunity to register for an email list or to give you their email address for something like a lead magnet, you can begin to track their interactions on your website. So you can see the pages they visit, the questions they might have, the concerns they might have, the comparison pages they might visit. And so when that first contact happens, you already have a lot of information that is very helpful when it comes to making sure that you're able to answer their objections or follow up basically on issues that are important to them. So by seeing this information, Let's say they've scheduled a call with you. This is the first point of contact. You go into their contact information under a system like HubSpot. You can see the kinds of products and services that they're interested in. You might have a variety of products and services. You can see the things that they've researched. You can see the articles they've consumed, the videos they've consumed, and you can put together a much more complete idea of what it is that you can do to serve them better. So to kind of bring all this together, I would say the core benefit at the end of the day, when you really look at how this strategy plays out and allows you to grow your audience and bring in more people and build trust and build authority and to make that first contact much more effective, really, this is all about saving your salespeople time. Because at the end of the day, when a customer contacts you after they've done all this research, you can skip past a lot of the repetitive questions, you can skip past a lot of the repetitive objections, and you can move to customers that have already kind of self-filtered themselves, where they've already decided this is the right product for them, they already know it's the right product for them, maybe there are some nuances that they need some help with at the very end, and that's obviously where a salesperson can step in and answer some remaining questions and simply provide a high degree of service throughout the experience, but, the big value here is that your content is out there working for you, pre-qualifying customers and making it that much easier for your salespeople to focus on kind of the last mile, so to speak. Just helping customers that are already ready to make a purchase, manage those fine details and ultimately finish the sale. So those are three of my favorite insights from the book. There's obviously so much more covered that can only really be covered in a format like this, including, I'll give you a few examples here, how to use the principle of disarmament to build trust, how to use what the book describes as assignment selling to nurture your best customers, and then of course just a lot more detail on many of the things that we just touched on throughout this episode. So if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a marketer, if you're a salesperson, or really anybody else that's interested in using content marketing to grow your business, then I recommend that you consider picking up a copy of They Ask, You Answer by Marcus Sheridan. That's it for this episode. If you have any questions or comments about anything that we covered here, let me know down in the comment section below. As usual, if you're listening to the audio edition, I'll include a link in the show notes that'll take you over to the video edition where you too can participate in the comment section. If you're interested in more content like this in the future, where we go through some of the best business books out there, then I recommend that you subscribe or follow my updates on social media so you don't miss out on future episodes. Thank you for tuning in, and I look forward to connecting with you again in a future episode.